Live from New York City, it's theCUBE. Covering Lenovo Transform 2.0. Brought to you by Lenovo. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Lenovo Transform. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Stu Miniman. We're joined by Madhu Mata. He is the VP and GM, High Performance Computing and Artificial Intelligence at Lenovo, and Dr. Daniel Bruner, the CTO of Synet at University of Toronto. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. So before the cameras were rolling, you were talking about the Lenovo mission in this area to, to use the power of supercomputing to help solve some of society's most pressing challenges, and that is climate change and, and, and curing cancer. Can you talk a little bit, to, to tell our viewers a little bit about what you do and how you, you see your mission? Yeah, so our tagline is basically solving humanity's greatest challenges. And uh, as we're also now the number one supercomputer provider in the world, as measured by uh, the rankings of the top 500, and you know, that comes with a lot of responsibility. Uh, and we believe that, uh, you know, one, we take that very responsibility very seriously, but more importantly, we work with some of the largest uh, research institutions, universities, all over the world, as they do research, and this amazing research, whether it's particle physics, like you saw this morning, whether it's cancer research, whether it's climate modeling, I mean, we're sitting here in, in New York City, and our headquarters is in Raleigh, right in the path of, uh, Hurricane Florence. So the ability to predict the next tsunami, the ability to predict the next hurricane is absolutely critical to get early warning signs and you know, a lot of survival depends on that. So we work with these institutions, jointly develop custom solutions to ensure that all this research, one, is powered and secondly, works seamlessly and all their researchers have access to this infrastructure 24-7. So Danny, tell us a little bit about Skynet. To, to, uh, tell us what you do and then I want to hear how you work together. And, and, and no know. relation with Skynet, I've been assured, right? No, not at all. <laughs> it is also no relationship with a, another network that's called the same, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so Skynet is a, an organization that's basically the University of Toronto and the Associated Research Hospitals. And we happen to run Canada's largest supercomputer. Uh, we're one of a number of uh, computer sites around Canada that are tasked with uh, providing resources and support, like support is, is the most important, to academia in Canada. So all academics from all the different universities in, in the country, they come and use our systems. And from Uni University of Toronto, they can also go and use the other systems. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Uh, our mission is, as I said, okay, we provide a system or a number of systems, we run them, but we really are about helping the researchers do their research. And we're all scientists, all, all the guys that work with me, we're all scientists uh, initially. We turned to computers because that was the way we do the research. Uh, you cannot do astrophysics other than computationally, observationally and computationally, but nothing else. Uh, climate science is the same story. You have so much data and so much modeling to do that you need a very large computer that, uh, and of course very good algorithms and, and very careful physics modeling for, a, for an extremely complex system, but ultimately needs a lot of horsepower to be able to even do a single simulation. So what I was showing uh, with, with Madhu at the booth earlier was results of a simulation that was done just prior us going into production with our Lenovo system, uh, where people were doing ocean circulation calculations. The ocean is obviously part of the big mm. earth system, which is part of the climate system as well. Uh, but they took a small patch of the ocean, a few kilometers uh, in, in size, in each direction, but did it at very, very high resolution. Even vertically going down to the bottom of the ocean so that the topography of the ocean floor can be taken into account. And that allows you to see, my, at, at a much smaller scale, the onset of tides, the onset of micro tides that allow water to mix the cold water from the, from the bottom and the hot water from the top. The mixing of nutrients, the, the, you know, how life goes on, the whole cycle is, is super important. Now that of course then gets coupled with the atmosphere and with the ice and with the radiation from the sun and all that stuff. We ran our, that calculation was run by a group from um, 
the main guy was from JPL in, Cal uh, in California. And he was running f at, on 48,000 cores, single runs at 48,000 cores, for about two to three weeks, and produced a petabyte of data, which is still being analyzed. So that, that's the that's the kind of calculation Scale. that's been that's enabled. Gives you a sense yeah. of just exactly. It's enabled by a system the size of the one we have. It was not possible to do that in Canada before this system. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, both when I lived on the vendor side and as an analyst, talking to labs and universities is, you love geeking out because first <laughs> of all, you know, you, you always have a need for newer, faster things yeah. because you, the example you just gave is like, oh wait, if I can get the, the next generation chipset, if the networking can be improved, you know, you can take that petabyte of data and process it so much faster. If I could only get more um, money to yeah, buy a bigger you know, one. <laughs> we, we've talked to the people at CERN and JPL and things yeah. like that, and it's like, this is where, you know, most companies, it's like, yeah, it's a little bit better and it might make things a little better and make things nice, but no, this is critical to move Absolutely. along the research. So, you know, talk a little bit more about kind of the, the infrastructure and what you look for and how that connects to the, the, the research and that kind of, you know, how, how you help close that gap over time. But, uh, but before we yeah. go, I just want to also highlight a point that uh, Danny made on solving humanity's greatest challenges, yeah. which is our motto. He talked about uh, the data analysis that he just did, right. uh, where they are looking at the surface of the ocean as well as going down, what is it, 264 vertical layers underneath? underneath the ocean to analyze that much of data to start looking at marine life and protecting marine life. As they start to un understand that level of vertical depth, they can start to figure out the nutrients value and other contents that are in that water to be able to start protecting marine life. There again, another, another humanity's greatest challenge right there that nothing, is given Nothing you happens in isolation, it's yeah. all interconnected. So, you know, when you finally got a grant, you're able to buy a computer how do you buy the computer that's going to give you the most bang for your buck? Uh, the best computer to do the science that we're all tasked with doing. So, it's tough, right? So you need to, uh, we don't fancy ourselves as computer architects. We engage the computer companies who really know about architecture to help us do it. So, the way we, do, we did our procurement was, Okay, vendors, we have a set pot of money. We're willing to spend every last penny of this money. You give us the biggest and the baddest <laughs> for our money. Now, it has to have a certain set of characteristics. You have to be able to solve a number of benchmarks, so some, some sample calculations that we provided. So, the ones that give you the best performance, that, that's a bonus. It also has to be able to do it with the least amount of power, so we don't have to heat up the world and, and, and pay through the nose with power. And those are, those are objective criteria that anybody can understand. But then there's all, also the other criteria. So how well will it run? How is it architected? How balanced is it? Um, did we get the I.O. subsystem for, for all the storage that was the one that actually meets the criteria? What other extras do we have that, would, that will help us make the system run uh, in a much smoother way, um, and for a wide variety of disciplines, because we run the biologists together with the physicists and the engineers and, and the humanitarians. I mean, it, uh, humanities people. Everybody uses the system. So, to make a long story short, uh, the proposal that we got from Lenovo won the, won the bid, both in, in terms of what we got for, uh, you know, in terms of hardware, and also the way it was put together, which was quite innovative. Yeah. So I want to hear about, about, so you said give us the biggest about us, we're willing to empty our, our coffers for this. So then does, where do you go from there? How, how closely do you work with um, Synet? How does the relationship evolve so, and do you work together to innovate and kind of yeah. keep going? So, you know, I, I, I see it as a, uh, it's not a segment or a division. I see high performance computing as a practice. And with any practice, it's many pieces that come together. You have a conductor, you have the orchestra, but at the end of the day, the delivery of that many systems is the concept. That's the way to look at it. So to deliver this, our practice starts with multiple teams. One's a benchmarking team that understands the application that uh, Dr. Gruner and Synet will be running. 
because they need to tune uh, to the application, the performance of the cluster. The second team is a set of solution architects that are deep engineers that understand our portfolio. Those two work together to say, against this application, let's build, like he said, the biggest, baddest, best performing solution uh, for that particular application. So those two teams work together. Then we have the third team that kicks in once we win the business, which is coming on site to deploy, manage, and install. And when Dr. Gluna talks about the infrastructure, it's a combination of hardware and software that all comes together. And the software is open source based that we built ourselves because we just felt there weren't the right tools in the industry to manage this level of infrastructure at that scale. So all this comes together to essentially rack and roll onto their site. Now let me, let me just add to that. It's not like we went to RFP in a vacuum. We had already talked to the vendors, right? We always do. You always go and they come to you and when's your next uh, you know, money coming and, and they always, it's, it's a dog and pony show and you know, they tell you what they have and this and that. With Lenovo, at least the team as we know it now used to be the IBM team, yep. the X-Systems team uh, who built our previous system. So a lot of these guys were already known, known to us and we're, we've, we've always interacted very, very well with them. So they were already aware of our thinking, where we were going, and that we're also open to suggestions for things that are non-conventional. Now, this can backfire, okay? So some, some data centers are very square, they, they will only prescribe what they want. We were not prescriptive at all. We said, give us ideas about what can make this work better. So these are the intangibles in, an, in a procurement process. Oh, you also have to believe in the team. If you don't know the team, or if you don't know their track record, then that, that's a no-no, right? Or, uh, or, or it, re, uh, so, it, it takes points away. So we brought innovations like Dragonfly, which is, Dr. Derek can talk about that, as well as we brought in, for the first time, Accelero, uh, which is a uh, software-defined storage vendor, and it was a small part of the bid, but still, you know, we were able to flex muscles and be more creative versus just a standard. All right, so my understanding, you've been using water cooling for about a decade now. Maybe yes. you can give us a little bit about your experiences, how it's matured over time, and then Mato will talk to us and bring us up to speed on Project Neptune. Okay, so our first procurement about 10 years ago, again, it, that was the model we came up with. We, after years of, of racking our brains, we could not decide how to build a data center and what computers to buy. It was like a chicken and egg process. So we ended up saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. Here's the money, here is our total cost of operation that we can support. So that included the power bill, the water, the maintenance, the whole works. So much can be used for infrastructure and the rest is for, for the operational mm -hmm. part. And we said to the vendors, you guys do the, do the work. We want, again, the biggest and the baddest that we can operate within this budget. Uh, so obviously it has to be energy efficient, among other things. We couldn't design a data center and then put in the systems that we didn't know existed, or right. vice versa. So that's how it started. So the initial design was built by IBM, and they designed the data center for us to use water cooling for everything. And they put rear doors, rear door heat mm -hmm. exchangers on, on the racks um, as a means of avoiding the use of just blowing air and trying to contain the air, which is A, is less efficient, the air, and is also much more difficult. You can flow water very efficiently. So you open the door of, of one of these racks. It's amazing. And it's hot air coming out. But you take the heat right there in situ. You remove it through a radiator. It's just a, like, like your car, car radiator. radiator. It works very well. Now, it would be nice if we could, if we could do even better by, by doing the, the hot water cooling and all that. Yeah. Uh, but we're not in a university environment we're in a strip mall out in the boonies. Uh, so we couldn't reuse the heat. Now places like LRZ, they're reusing the heat right. produced by the computers to heat their buildings. Wow. Or if we're, we're by a hospital that always needs hot water, then we could have done it. Uh, but but it's, it's really interesting how uh, the, other, the, the upshot of that design is that we ended up with the most efficient data center certainly in Canada, and one of the most efficient in North America 10 years ago. Our PUE was 1.16, that was the design point. And this is not with direct mm. water cooling to the chip. Right, right. So, 
All right. So bring us up to speed, Project Neptune in general. Yeah, so, and, uh, so Neptune, as the name suggests, is the name of the uh, god of the sea. And we chose that to brand our entire suite of uh, liquid cooling uh, products. And liquid cooling products is end-to-end -end in the sense that it's not just hardware, but it's also software. And the other key part of Neptune is a lot of these, in fact, most of these products were built not in a vacuum, but designed and built in conjunction with key partners like Barcelona Supercomputer, uh, LRZ in Germany, uh, in Munich. So these were real live customers working with us jointly to design these uh, products. So Neptune essentially allows you, very simplistically put, it's an entire suite of hardware and software that allows you to run very high performance pr uh, processes at a level of power and cooling utilization that's much, much, like it's like using a much lower processor. So it dissipates that much heat. The other key part is we're using, you know, the, 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 the normal, the normal way of cooling anything is run chilled water. We don't use chilled water, so you save the money of chillers. We use ambient temperature up to 50 degrees, 90% efficiency, 50 degree goes in, 60 degree comes out. It's, 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 it's really amazing, the entire so It's 50 suite Celsius, of, not Fahrenheit. It's Celsius, correct. Oh, wow. And he talked about, uh, Dr. Gruner talked about Cyanet with the rear door heat exchanger. You, are, you actually got to stand in front of it to feel the magic of this, right? As geeky as that is. You, have, you open the door and it's this hot 60, 65 degree C air. You close the door, it's this cool 20 degree air that's coming up. So the uh, costs of uh, running a data center drop dramatically with either the Rio heat exchanger, uh, direct to node product, which is, we just got released the SC650, or we have something called the thermal transfer module, which replaces a normal heat sink. Yeah. Where for an air cooled, we bring water cooled goodness to an air cooled product. Right. Danny, I wonder if you can give us the, the final word. Just the, the climate science in general. How's the community doing? Any you know technological things that are holding us back right now, or anything that excites you about the research right now? Technologies. Technology holds you back by virtue of the size of the calculations that you need to do. But there's also physics that hold you back. Yes. Because doing the actual modeling is very difficult, and you have to be able to believe that the physics models actually work. Now, this is one of the interesting things that, uh, that Dick Peltier, who happens to be our scientific director, and he's also one of the top sci uh, climate scientists in the world, uh, he's proven through some of his calculations that the models are actually pretty good. So the models were, were designed for current conditions, with current data, so that they would reproduce the evolution of the climate that we can measure today. Now what about climate that ha started happening 10,000 years ago? Right? The climate was going on, it, it's been going on forever and ever. There's been glaciations, there's been all, all, all these events. Well, it turns out that it, it has been recorded in history that there are some oscillations in temperature and, and, other, and other quantities that are, happen about every thousand years. And nobody had been able to prove that prove why they would happen. So it turns out that the same models that we use for climate uh, calculations today, if you take them back and do what's called paleoclimate, so you start with approximating right. the conditions that happened 10,000 years ago and then you move it forward. These things reproduce those oscillations exactly. So it's very encouraging that the climate models actually makes sense. So, we're not talking in a vacuum. We're not predicting the end of the world uh, just because. These calculations are right, they're correct. They're predicting that the, the, the temperature of the Earth is, is climbing, and it's true, we're seeing it, but it will continue unless we do, we do something. Right? So, it, it's extremely interesting. The, now he's <coughs> applying, he's beginning to apply those results of the paleoclimate two studies with our um, anthropologists and archaeologists who are trying to understand the events that happened in the Levant, in the Middle East, thousands of years ago, and correlate them with climate events. Now, 
Is that cool or what? It's very cool. Solving I, I, humanity's greatest challenges again. You, the, the, you just add a global warming. You have a fun job. You but, have a but fun it was, job. And, and it's all the interdisciplinarity that now has been made possible. Before we couldn't do this. Right. Ten years ago we couldn't run those calculations. Now we can. Amazing. So it's really cool. Great. Well, Madhu, Danny, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was thank really fun talking us. to you. Thanks. Right. Thanks. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. We will have more from Lenovo Transform just after this.